morning. What a wonderful way to start our Sunday service. Worshiping and praising the Lord. Doesn't get much better. I love to worship and praise the Lord. That's actually why we're here. Actually not here to listen to me. Oh, that's just a benefit. Just a benefit. We're here to worship the Lord. <laughs> well, is it just me? Or has anyone else noticed that evil seems to be prospering? Especially when you look in D.C. I don't know, you know. But there comes a danger with that. We can find ourselves getting angry and upset. And in the Bible, there was a story about a man named Asif who had the same problem. So today, I want to look at this, and I want to ask you something. Are you getting better, or are you getting bitter? And I'm going to read Psalm 73 where we find this. Truly, God is only good to Israel, even those who are upright and pure in heart. But as for me... My feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious of the foolish and the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they suffer no violent fangs in their death, or they, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men. Neither are they smitten or plagued like other men. Therefore, pride is about their necks like a chain. Violence covers them like a garment, like a long, luxurious robe. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than their heart could wish, and the imaginations of their mind overflow with follies. They scoff and wickedly utter oppressions. They speak loftily from on high, malicious and blasphemy. They set their mouths against and speak down from heaven, and their tongues swagger through the earth invading even heaven with blasphemy and smearing earth with slanders. Therefore, his people return here, and the water's full cup offered by the wicked are blindly drained by them. And they say, how does God know? Is there any knowledge of the Most High? Behold, there are ungodly who always prosper and are at ease in the world. They increase in riches. Surely then in vain, I have cleansed my heart and washed my hands of innocence. For all the long day, I have been smitten and plagued and chastened every morning. Had I spoken thus and given expression to my feelings, I would have uttered untrue or would have dealt treacherously against the generations of your children. But when I consider how to understand this, it was too great an effort for me. It was too painful until I went into the sanctuary of God. For then I understood, for I considered their end. After all, you do set the wicked in, slip, in, wicked in slippery places, and you cast them down to ruin and destruction. How they become desolate in a moment. They utter consumed with their utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream which seems real. Until one awakens, so, O oh Lord, when you arouse yourself to take note of the wicked, you will despise their outward show. For the heart, my heart was grieved, embittered, and in a state of ferment, and I was pricked in my heart as with the sharp fang of a snake. So foolish and stupid and brutish was I, and arrogant, I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel. And afterwards, receive me to honor and to glory. Whom have I been? Whom have I in heaven but you? Am I have no delight or desires on earth besides you? My flesh and my heart fail, but God is my rock and firm strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, you are those, behold, those are far from you shall perish. You shall destroy all who are false, 
and you, like spiritual harlots, shall depart from me. But it is good for me to draw near to God, for I put trust in, in the Lord God and made him my refuge, and I tell you of all your works. Amen. Has anyone ever felt this way? When we look around, we see evil spreading across the land, and those that are doing evil are openly praised. They are caught doing what's wrong, and they are rewarded, and they're promoted. They get riches and fame, power, and long lives. They seem to escape all consequences and trouble. And for those that strive to do what is right, are met with all manner of hardships and physical ailments. And you look around and think, what is the point of doing good? Doing what is right is is hard with seemingly little reward. While doing what's wrong comes easy and natural, and it seems to come with all the best things that this life has to offer. This is how Asa felt. Asa started to regress towards bitterness because he struggled with overreacting to the prosperity, pleasures, and privileges of others. See, we all have to choose. Do we come better or do we slip into bitterness, cynicism, and negativity? The uh, Hebrews 12, 15 reminds us, see to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up causing trouble and defiling many. We must be on guard so that we don't let a root of bitterness grow up inside of us. Abraham Lincoln said, I've been driven to my knees many times by the overwhelming conviction that I have nowhere else to go. This missionary and his wife, uh, they were on their way home from the mission field, and uh, they were on this large ship, and also on the same ship, there was a well-known dignitary that was traveling there as well. And uh, when the ship docked, the missionary and his wife um, watched as the dignitary was greeted with pomp and circumstances and music and a large crowd of people. And after the commotion, the dignitary um, of, the, of the dignitary, the missionary couple walked down the plank, and they were totally unnoticed. And the husband says to his wife, it's not fair that this man gets all the recognition. He hasn't done anything for the Lord. And his wife said to her husband, but dear, we are not home yet. Asaf teaches us a great deal about the struggle between bitterness and betterment in Psalm 73. The key verse that I really love in this and will really draw me to this whole, this whole chapter because it's verses 21 through 26. It's because it's such a beautiful praise to the Lord of love and guidance and how Asaf got out of his funk. And he says, when my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was like a beast before you, yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterwards you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? As an earth has nothing that I desire but you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is my strength of my heart. And my portion forever. What beautiful words written to God. And God is trying to say to us through his words, I am with you. I am with you. These four words are like a safety net. Protecting you from falling into despair. Because you are human, you will always have ups and downs in your life experience. But the promise of my presence limits how far that you can go down. And as soon as you remember that I am with you, your perspective changes radically. 
Instead of bemoaning your circumstances, he says, you can look to me for help. You can recall that you are not, not only am I with you, I am holding you by your right hand. I will guide you with my counsel. And afterwards, I will take you into glory. This is the exact perspective that you need. It's the assurance of God's presence and glorious hope in heaven. You see, bitterness is simply the absence of the betterment we find when we praise God. I'm going to say that again. Bitterness is the absence of getting better that we have when we praise God. When we focus on what is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, excellent, admirable, upright, praiseworthy, we can fill our mind with that which makes us better, thereby eliminating bitter thoughts. A, uh, a college professor challenged the class with this question. Did God make everything there is? One student bravely answered, yes. Everything, young man? Yes, sir, he did, the young man replied. The professor responded, if God made everything, then God made evil. And if we can only create from within ourselves, then God is evil. The, uh, the student didn't have a response for the professor. And the professor was happy to have once again proved the Christian faith to be a myth. Then another young man raised his hand and said, may I ask a question, sir? Yes, you may, responded the professor. The young man stood up and said, sir, is there such a thing as cold? Of course there is. What kind of question is that? Haven't you ever been cold? The young man replied, Actually, sir, cold does not exist. What we consider to be cold is really only the absence of heat. Absolute zero is when there is absolutely no heat. But cold does not really exist. We have only created that term to describe how we feel when heat is not there. The young man continued, sir, is there such a thing as dark? Of course there is, the professor replied. And once again, the student replied, actually, sir, darkness does not exist. Darkness is really only the absence of light. Darkness is only a term man has developed to describe what happens when there is no light present. Finally, the young man asked, sir, is there such a thing as evil? The professor responded, of course there is. We have rapes, murders, and violence everywhere in the world, and those things are evil. The student replied, actually, sir, evil does not exist. Evil is simply the absence of God. Evil is a term man has developed to describe the absence of God. God did not create evil. It isn't like truth or love, which exists as virtues, like heat and light. Evil is simply the state of where God is not present, like cold without heat, like darkness without light. And uh, the professor didn't have anything to say. You see, outside of God's presence is the perfect environment for all the worst parts of our nature to grow. Asaph, he was no slouch. He was a successful man of God. He wrote several sacred lyrics and worship songs that 2 Chronicles 29 30 tells us about. Not only did he write Psalm 73, but he also wrote the next 10 in succession. And also, uh, I believe Psalms 50 is also accredited to him. So Asaph was a musical man. He was known as a choir director. So he obviously had the ability to help lead in worship music. He was used by God in many ways. But 
even he struggled with the temptation to give in to bitterness, anger, and self-pity. Asaph was used greatly by God as a prophet. And also in 2 Chronicles, we see that Asaph, he was a seer, or he was a visionary for his time. But he was also a fruitful man in that his children walked with God. We find in 1 Chronicles 25 that his four sons participated in conducting the chorus that was sung in the temples. However, Asaph started to regress towards bitterness and he struggled to overcome because he reacted to the prosperity and privileges that others had. I mean, when you read verses 3 through 12, you get an idea of how terribly jealous and envious Asaph had become, despite his own track record of successes. You see, no matter how far we have come, you are still subject to slipping into bitterness and spiritual regression and the mire of loss of the focus on Jesus, the author and protector of our faith, perfecter, who for the joy set before him did not mind the difficulties, but endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. Some of us, we can become embittered, angry, and impatient with God when we compare ourselves to others. But you remember what um, Jesus told Peter when Peter was trying to compare himself to John in uh, John 21? Jesus is like, if I want John to remain here until I come back, what is it to you? Why? Because you follow me. Let's not lose focus on who we follow. Let's not be comparing our situations and our lot to others because we sure are following Jesus and we need to be comparing our lives to his. And that's where we stand. And it reminds me of the song that we often sing. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And what? The things of this world will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Sometimes we get lost. Sometimes we feel our work, it's not appreciated. Or it, doesn't, it makes very little difference in this world. And that's when we can fall into that bitterness trap. Asaph felt that his service to the Lord was in vain. Perhaps because he saw no physical evidence of the reward. Asaph also began to fall in the pit of bitterness's twin sister, self-pity. When we are weary or unwell... This demonic trap is such a great danger. Don't even go near the edge of the pit because it's edges that crumble easily. And before you know it, you are all the way down. It is so much harder to get out of that pit than it is to keep a safe distance from it. We always need to be on our guard. There are several ways to protect us. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. I don't even know what it is. I didn't want to stop anything to say it, but it was annoying me too. (laughs) So there are several ways to protect yourself against self-pity. All right. And this is how, this is what helped Asif, all right, when you are occupied with praising and thanksgiving to God, it is impossible to feel sorry for yourself. If you're in a funk, you got something going on, you fell down in a pit, you're in one of these things, you want to know how to get out. Apparently you do. It's praise and worship. That's why we come here. You don't come here to listen to a sermon. Sure, that's great. It helps out. You come here first and foremost to praise and worship the Lord. You praise your way out of it. You see, the closer you live to God, 
the more distance you put between you and the pit. Living in the light of God's presence by turning your eyes to Jesus. Then, and only then, will you be able to run the race that is set before you without stumbling and falling. Let us come into the presence of God daily with singing and serve the Lord with gladness and know that he is God. Amen. See, we serve the Lord out of love, obedience, and trust. Not because we get any recognition for what we do. So be sure that that is your motivation. And try to not just only focus on this present, which is so, so important. But thank God for the things that he has done for you in the past. And also be hopeful about things he will do with you in the future. Jesus said, you know, he's like, I'm leaving. He's like, all the great things I did, you're going to do some better stuff. And because I'm leaving, you're going to get the Holy Spirit that is going to allow you to do stuff. And that you ask anything in my name, and then I will do it. The problem is, so often our prayers are things desired in a carnal world. Money, comfort, ease. Our prayers can be rooted and come from our selfish nature. And then we wonder why God isn't answering our prayers. When God is the central focus of your desire, our prayers will sound very different. They will flow from a completely different place. And it will ask for very different things. So don't personalize your problems. Don't personalize them. Don't think, ah, it's uh, this happening to me, this happening to me. And then you go around and you look at these people in the world and, oh my goodness, look at all these people. They're doing this, 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 this. It's so much better. Don't personalize them. The Lord promises that whatever a person sows, they will reap. Regardless of how things look for the wicked, you know that the Lord is the judge, evaluator, and accountant for us all. God gave Asaph strength, stability, and sustenance because he worshipped even when he struggled. It's okay to struggle. It's okay to go through things. In fact, you will go through things. But how do you respond? You think just by coming to church... And sitting there like a bump in a log during song service, you're going to get out of it? You have to praise your way out of it. Amen. You have to be thankful that the Lord is going to get you out of it. You see, when you're struggling with bitterness, you have to be sure to take time out to praise God for his prevailing love, his hope, his power, his purpose, his problem-solving abilities, and thank him for allowing you to learn to be content in whatever circumstances that you are in. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. He will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory through Jesus Christ. And we need to get around godly people who can encourage us to look up instead of looking around. Amen. Perhaps Asif was spending too much time in the company of the ungodly instead of with the godly. And Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 teaches us to let us consider how we can spur each other on towards love and good deeds. And let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another all the more as you see that day approaching. Does anyone see that day approaching? Yeah? Well, I got news for you. It's only going to get harder. I know that's not what everybody wants to hear, but it is. And I'm not trying to offend anyone that isn't here, 
Because there are some legit reasons. But me, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to worship him. I have decided to let him lead my life. I have decided to be in his house of worship whenever I am physically able. I have decided that no virus, no hint of danger, no threat to my person is going to keep me from being in the house of the Lord. While our brothers and sisters around the world are being imprisoned and executed for what we are doing right now. I might not be too popular to say that right now. But it's good to remind yourself of what you have decided. The farther we go, the more that we are going to need the fellowship of godly people. As yet in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. This 92-year-old, petite, uh, well-poised, proud woman who was fully dressed each morning by 8 o'clock with her hair fashionably done and her makeup perfectly applied, even though she was legally blind, she was going home to a, going to a nursing home today because her husband of 70 years passed away, making the move necessary. And uh, after many hours of waiting in the lobby of the nursing home, she smiled sweetly when she told, was told that her room was ready. As she maneuvered her walker towards the elevator, she was provided a visual description of the room, which included her eyelet sheets that had been hung in her window. I love it, she stated with enthusiasm of an eight-year-old who had just been given a puppy. Well, Mrs. Jones, just wait, you haven't seen the room. That doesn't have anything to do with it, she replied. Happiness is something you decide ahead of time. Yeah. <laughs> Whether I like my room or not does not depend on how the furniture is arranged. It's how my mind is arranged. I have already decided to love it. It's a decision that I make up, wake up, make every morning when I wake up. I have a choice. I can spend this day recounting the difficulty I have with parts of my body that don't work. Or I can be thankful for the ones that do. Each day is a gift, she said. And as long as my eyes are open, I'll focus on the new day and the happy memories I have stored away for just this specific time in my life. Old age is like a bank account. You can only withdraw what you have put into it. So my advice to you is you deposit a lot of happiness into your bank account of memories. We can put a few biblical rules to the test that can pave our way, that can help us put these memories in our bank account. One is accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and let him rule and reign in your life. Amen. That is the beginning of all happiness, all wisdom. It is the foundation of the path to eternity. Amen. The second one is free your heart from hatred. Hatred, a person doesn't, can't feel your hatred. Whoever you hate, they can't feel it. All it does is sit right here and destroy you and destroy your love and destroy your relationship with God. Free your mind from worries. I know it's easier said than done. But honestly, it's a decision as well. You've got to give the things that you're worrying about to God. Just hand it to him. Let him worry about it. The next one is live simply. Live simply. So often, we complicate our own lives by filling it with so many things and then running around that you don't have rest and happiness. You're just doing, 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 doing. Simplify your life. Give more. I'm not talking just about money. I'm talking about of who you are. Give of who you are. It takes effort to give of yourself and who you are. I mean, Jesus, he literally 
He gave everything of who he was. He was always doing stuff for other people. So give more of who you are. Expect less. <laughs> I know it sounds funny, but if you drop that bar down <laughs> of what you expect out of people and in this life, you're going to be a lot happier. Let me tell you. <laughs> So then if something really good does happen or somebody does something that you don't expect, you're like, all right, all right. Drop that bar down a little bit. Expect less out of people. And the last one, avoid murmuring and complaining. <laughs> if you do have a complaint, you better come with a solution. <laughs> don't just bring a complaint. Bring an idea of how to solve it. Amen. Then, that, then it becomes constructive. <laughs> These seven steps will put the wind beneath your wings as you pursue life, liberty, and happiness through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> you know, there's a few verses. Like when I'm over trying to overcome something or I, I got something on my heart, uh, I, you know, I look for specific verses about overcoming. I'll give you guys a few of them. Uh, John 16, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you will have peace. In this world you will have tribulation. You will have problems. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Romans 12, 21. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Uh, 1 John 4, 4. You are of God, little children. You have overcome them because of he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And in Proverbs, the horse is prepared for the day of battle, but deliverance is from the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 15, 57, but be thanks unto God who gives the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. You get better as you praise, as you thank, as you share with others the bounty that we have because the Lord Jesus Christ is our shepherd. What? What a wonderful shepherd. So kind. So good. This whole, his whole plan is so, so beautiful, so big, perfect. Psalms 23 is uh, it's a beloved chapter for so many people. It's the way it's written. Uh, it's, it just speaks to people on so many different levels. But I wanted to share with you what it means to me and how, when I read it, what it says. The Lord is my shepherd. That's a relationship. That's a relationship with the lover of your soul. It's real, not an abstract God thousands of miles of light years away. It's real. It's personal. He make it, I shall not want. That's supply. The Lord will supply all of your needs. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. That's rest. Sometimes... Uh, I lay down maybe for a nap or even to sleep and it seems all is right with the world. I lay there and it's peaceful, like everything, it's a perfect moment. And I thank the Lord for that moment. I'm like, I've, nothing hurts in my body, all my knees are mad, I feel love in my family around, like it's a perfect moment. And I thank the Lord for it and almost by the time I've done thanking the Lord, I'm asleep because everything is so right. He leadeth me beside the still waters. That's refreshment. He refreshes you. He gives you that peace and that calm. He restoreth my soul. That's healing. You know, we don't always get our healing in these bodies that we want. But all the time, 100%, when you come to the Lord, he restores your soul. He renews your spirit. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness. That's guidance. He guides my path. He lights it. I don't want, I don't want to go where I want to go. I want to go where he wants me to go. 
for his name's sake. That's purpose. You have a purpose in life. So many people struggle with this big problem of what am I here for? What's my purpose? Your purpose is to live for the Lord. And then what you do in this life will flow from that wherever he wants you. But your purpose is for his name's sake, not for yours. Yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's testing. We all have to go through tests. And spiritual tests, if you don't pass it, you don't go on to the next one. You have to retake it. But we all go through the tests. The Lord is with us. Because I will fear no evil. That's protection. I, when I think about the Lord's protection in my life, I am... Um, I don't even know 99% of everything he's protected me from. I'll never know in this life. And the 1% I do know about overwhelms me. I can't imagine knowing about all the stuff that I was protected from that never happened because of his protection. Thank you, Lord. Thou art with me. That's faithfulness. The Lord is faithful. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. That's discipline. I don't always want the discipline of the Lord in my life. I pray for it. I don't like it, but he disciplines those that he loves. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. That's hope. Even when things are going wrong in your life, even when you're surrounded by enemies, the Lord will sit you down and make a table before you and take care of all your needs. Thou anointest my head with oil. That's consecration. We are His. We are bought with a price, with the precious blood of Jesus. We are not our own. We are his. And my cup, my cup runneth over. That's abundance. The Lord is so good to me. I, I try to tell people all the time, his benefit plan, his package is amazing. I'm not talking about zeros in the bank account. Those are cool too if they happen. But there's so much more to this life than money. So much more. The quicker you learn that, the happier we'll be. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. That's blessing. The Lord blesses so much. He is so willing and eager to bless us. When we live a life that is endeavoring to put him first and to put him in our consciousness first. He wants to bless us. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. That's security. Man cannot pluck out of what's in God's hand. Nothing can take you out of God's love. Forever. That's eternity. How wonderful it is. I even I think about heaven and I think what makes heaven heaven, obviously, it's Jesus. The fact that you guys get to be there, my loved ones get to be there, is just icing on the cake. It would be perfect even if nobody else was there. Because it would be Jesus. 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 Oh, how much I love you. How much I love you. Well, keep this in mind. If you're going through anything, and even this week, you can read Psalm 23 and remember each verse 
of how he is with you, how he loves you. He will never leave you and never forsake you. And if it matters to you, it matters to him.